Yeah, hello. Um, I'm uh, Charles Grobe, and I've been asked to introduce our Grand Round speaker today, Dr. Michael Mithoffer. Uh, Dr. Mithoffer has been a, a good friend and colleague for the past 21 years, and I've followed his career during that time very closely and um, have nothing but the greatest respect for his, uh, his accomplishments, which are considerable. Dr. Mithoffer uh, went to medical school at the um, uh, Me Medical University of South Carolina, did his training there, trained in internal medicine, emergency medicine, and psychiatry. He's been triple boarded uh, for some years. And um, since uh, the year uh, 2001, he has been closely affiliated with the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies and has been their lead um, researcher uh, for their uh, comprehensive program utilizing an MDMA treatment model for chronic refractory PTSD. His results, as he will share with us, have, have been nothing short of outstanding and it has uh, attracted the attention of uh, much of the field. In a relatively short period of time, MDMA treatment has gone from kind of unknown, not on the field uh, treatment modality to one that is uh, uh, acquiring great interest and, and increased research activity uh, around the country and abroad. So Dr. Medhofer has uh, published extensively on the topic of uh, MDMA specifically his, his research, uh, where he's been the lead researcher on, on treating uh, chronic PTSD. And I'm delighted now to introduce Michael Mithoffer to present uh, his, his, his uh, uh, pioneer work, his groundbreaking work on the use of MDMA in psychiatry. So Michael, take it away. Thanks very much, Charlie. It's, um... I, I will say uh, your career in this area started even before mine, so I've I've followed your career too. Um, so I, I really appreciate this chance to share a little bit about our research. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so I I am um, a real pleasure to give an update on on this research we've been doing for over about 20 years now, a little more. Um, studying MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder, and then there have been some other uh, MDMA studies too. Um, I received payments from MAPS Public Benefit Corporation for, as a contractor to work on clinical trials and training and supervision of research therapists. I'm on the advi Scientific Advisory Board of Wake and Life Sciences. And I want to remind everybody that MDMA is still an investigational drug. We'll be talking about clinical trials, not approved treatments, and um, it, um, MDMA, like all, all drugs, has risks as well as possible benefits. It's an interesting model that we've been studying um, this, doing this work under. It, this has all been uh, sponsored by the no, nonprofit MAPS and the MAPS through the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation. So it's a, it's a model of public benefit drug development, which is is something new really. And um, all any profits that come eventually will all go back to the one shareholder, uh, the nonprofit. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna give you a little background on MDMA, talk about um, our phase two and phase tr three trials a bit. I'm gonna go quickly through that because um, you can read the details in our published papers, which I'll point to, but to give you a, an overview of the results, uh, talk about a little bit about possible mechanisms and also the method we use for this approach to therapy. And then um, I'm gonna go quickly through all that so we have time for uh, some quotes from participants and then a sh about a 10 minute video clip from a research session. So you can get a little more feel about for what these sessions are like and then we'll have some time for discussion at the end. So why, why do this in the first place? Um, you know, our focus on PTSD has been really because um, it's been recognized that psychotherapy, not psychopharmacology, is really the definitive treatment for PTSD. Uh, pharmacology can help with the symptoms, of course, sometimes, but the definitive treatment requires therapy, and um, it doesn't always work. About at least half the time, I think, 
people are not adequately served by existing trauma uh, focused treatments for PTSD. So we're asking the question, could a drug, in this case, MDMA, catalyze the psychotherapeutic process? So it's quite different from a straight drug trial. We're really not just studying the drug, we're studying whether it can uh, catalyze psychotherapy. This is MDMA. It was patented in 1914 by Merck. They did, never did anything with it, but it's now long off patent. Um, and it's um, often referred to as a psychedelic. And you know the terminology in this area is still kind of being hashed out. I think in many ways, this is an appropriate term if psychedelic means mind manifesting. That's a fair description, I think, of, of what happens with MDMA, but it's quite different from classic psychedelics like psilocybin or LSD. So the term intactogen is one of the terms that's been suggested, meaning to touch within, um, referring to this quality of MDMA, uh, helping people be more in contact with their own inner process as well as uh, other people's um, process. And it tends to increase empathy, often a sense of well-being, increase insightfulness is common. And in general, there's less perceived loss of control than with classic psychedelics. People don't have hallucinations and um, it's less disorienting. Having said that, this is relative, so especially people with severe PTSD can find it um, challenging and have a sense of losing control. But relatively speaking, it's, it's in a way gentler in that respect. <clears throat> it has a complicated pharmacology, um, largely uh, involving monoamines, uh, increases in monoamines, release of serotonin especially, and um, activity at serotonin receptors. Um, it also increases levels of a number of hormones, uh, oxytocin and prolactin being maybe the most interesting in terms of psychological effects. And, you know, this is not a new idea to use MDMA with therapy. There were a number of uh, case reports by very reputable people uh, in the late 70s and early 80s uh, when it was being used by a number of psychiatrists and psychologists, other therapists um, in conjunction with psychotherapy. And they uh, reported that it, it could be useful. So, um, but during that period, there were no clinical trials done. You know, MDMA was not an approved drug, but it was not illegal either. And then um, in 1985, it was um, decriminalized by the DEA, put in, in Schedule 1. Um, Dr. Grove was one of the people that testified in the hearings that um, the judge concluded it would be make sense to have it in Schedule 3, but that was overruled and ended up in Schedule 1, which uh, made research a lot more difficult. The first um, really movement toward um, formal clinical trials was by Charlie Grove at Harvard UCLA Medical Center. Um, the first phase one trial testing safety and pharmacology and physiology in healthy volunteers. So it was really Dr. Grove's first study that allowed us to uh, go on to uh, phase three, phase two when we started. There were then after uh, this first phase one study, there were a couple more in the US and, and some in Europe. So <clears throat> that allowed us to start with phase two trials. Um, so this is the timeline of, of our activities with phase two and fa phase two to start with. Um, we got our first FDA approval and in 2001. It took until February of 2004 to get DEA and IRB approvals. That was kind of a long and winding road that we don't have time to go into today, but we got got the approval and we enrolled our first um, participant in the first phase two trial a few months later in 2004. Then as of 2016, uh, there were six completed uh, MAPS phase two trials of MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD. And based on those promising results, uh, the FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation for MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD and allowed us to go on to phase three. And we took an extra step of doing a special protocol assessment to really nail down 
all the details of phase three to make sure it was adequate for a new drug application if it if successful. So <clears throat> the way these trials are designed um, is an important feature of this drug assisted therapy. Um, this is the basic design of the phase three, phase two trials. So going from left to right, you know, first informed consent, of course, then careful medical and psychological screening by outside psychologists and, and physicians. And then um, these first three green lines are preparatory sessions. So it's very important to prepare people for uh, the experience, what it might be like, and also the approach to therapy that I'll talk more about. Then these three triangles are the only time MDMA is administered in eight hour sessions with two therapists about a month apart. And then the green lines in between or following the triangles are the, we call integration sessions. Uh, they're follow-up sessions to help people integrate the experience that they've had. We think those are very important too. So people are randomized in, in phase two, people are randomized to either uh, active dose of MDMA, usually 125 milligrams, um, versus either inactive placebo or a low dose comparator. So whatever they're randomized to for the first experimental session, they also receive the same condition in the second session in a double blind fashion. And then uh, about a month or two after the third session, depending on the protocol, after the second session, experimental session, depending on the protocol, then we repeat the outcome measures, the symptom uh, measures and break the blind. Then if people turned out to have gotten active dose both times, they can go on to have a third active dose session open label. If they got placebo or low dose comparator, then they can elect to enter a crossover and go through the protocol again with three active dose sessions. And then we have follow-up at two months and at one year or longer. So that's, that's how it works. Only three administrations of MDMA about a month apart in uh, eight hour therapy sessions. These are some of the papers that came from those phase two trials. The, the first three are from two of the trials we did in Charleston. The first was um, crime related PTSD, mostly childhood sexual abuse and rape. We did a 42 month follow-up for that trial that showed good durability of effect for most people. And then the second trial we did was veterans and first responders using the same approach. We also had very um, promising results. It showed that the same approach in these trials at least worked with um, war or service related trauma or with, with uh, sexual abuse or other crime related trauma. These two papers are from the sites in Switzerland and, and Boulder, Colorado, where the, it was a mixed uh, cause of, of, of PTSD and also promising results. We published the pooled phase two results in 2019 and um, 103 people in uh, six sites in four countries. And we had a large effect size after two sessions, 0.8 after three sessions, 0.9. Um, and this is um, subtracting the effect of the therapy alone, which was actually uh, quite a robust effect of those long therapy sessions, even in people who had, these people had all failed prior treatment. Um, when he, if we look at the pre-post effect size, um, it's even, even larger, up to 1.9 after three sessions, if you're not subtracting the uh, effect of all the therapy alone, because the placebo group is really the therapy only group. So this is the um, uh, graph of that. This is the um, change in the CAPS score. This is CAPS four in the phase two. So you can see the um, uh, control group had it with all the, that therapy had about a, a 10 point drop in the CAPS and much greater when it was therapy plus the active doses of MDMA. And then we did a, a pool of long-term follow-up from those six uh, phase two studies at least a year uh, later. And we saw in you know, the majority of people 
continued improvement 12 months later. So this was um, consistent with our way of thinking that this, uh, the way this seems to work um, is that the MDMA catalyzes the therapeutic process and that process keeps unfolding long after the last treatment with MDMA or th therapy. So that's consistent with the way we've, we think about it. Um, so that was phase two that, that got breakthrough therapy designation and led us on to phase three, which is where we are now. So we um, our discussions with FDA, we arrived on this um, plan to have two phase three studies called MAP1 and MAP2, and uh, each with 100 people. Of course, that's smaller than most phase three studies because of the effect size, but um, we thought that was adequate. And um, you'll notice in the first, in MAP1, the last row of 10 people is um, a different color. That's because we actually did not treat 100 because of the COVID restrictions came. So at, at that point, when we had treated 90 people, it made sense to stop there and the FDA agreed with that. So that was the pivotal phase three trial that we've finished. The second one is underway. And in fact, enrollment is complete. And uh, we expect um, to finish the study in, in probably October of this year. So um, it, the design was similar to phase two, except there was no crossover. Um, that comes, we have a separate study, a crossover study for people who got placebo. But in this study, there was, it was inactive placebo with all the therapy versus MDMA, uh, starting with um, 75 milligrams the first time and then increasing to 125 with the subsequent sessions. So again, only three administrations of MDMA uh, in eight hour therapy sessions with uh, preparation and integration being an important part of it. Uh, we published the results of that first phase three trial last year in Nature Medicine. Um, this was, um, these were people with uh, chronic PTSD, um, severe chronic PTSD at 15 centers. There were 80, more than 80 new therapists or experienced therapists who were new to this way of working. So we uh, train them with our training program. We have adherence raters that uh, test the fidelity to the method and everything is videotaped. And, and um, there's a lot of um, effort to stand and make sure that therapy is consistent among sites. Um, and um, we, you know, blinding has always been a challenge. So we, we took the extra step of uh, the independent raters who are doing the CAPS scores and other things are um, remote and they never um, rate the same person twice to make sure they're especially well blinded. We studied these people had mostly had PTSD for a long time. You can see the range uh, five years or less uh, up to 20 or more years. So most people had had it uh, for more than five years and many for a lot longer than that. Uh, this is a bit about the demographics. Um, you can see the suicidal uh, ideation. We use the um, Columbia Su Suicide Severity Rating Scale uh, administered every time we saw people. Um, and you can see we did not exclude people with uh, suicidality, even people with serious suicide attempts, if we, uh, if they were seemed to be stable enough at the, that point, we didn't think it made sense to exclude suicidal people for this indication. And we also um, had, most people had had developmental trauma, more than 80%. And uh, the mean score on the adverse childhood experiences rating was was five. So these were um, many people with developmental trauma and severe childhood ex adverse childhood experiences, not just simple single incident PTSD. These are the results that we were very excited about. Um, you can see the top line is the uh, therapy only. This is the CAPS-5. Um, in, the, in phase three, and the bottom line is the MDMA group with the, all the same therapy. So um, to our uh, great satisfaction, the p-value was 0 0.0001. 
uh, with an effect size of 0.91. So uh, very encouraging uh, pivotal phase three trial. We also saw you know, significant uh, improvements on Sheehan disability scale and back depression inventory. And a really interesting part was we looked at um, the, any differences between people who had the associative subtype of PTSD on the CAPS uh, ratings and the people who had um, a, a high number of severe adverse childhood experiences. And um, usually these people are harder to treat. Um, and we found that they actually weren't with this method. There was no, um, no difference. In fact, the um, people with the associative subtype um, actually did a little better on average, but probably at least we can say it's at least equivalent. Um, I'll show you this. This is the drop in the CAPS-5, um, the dissociative subtype on the left and the um, people without dissociative subtype on the right. It was about a quarter of people had dissociative subtype. <clears throat> and we saw with the light blue is with therapy only, we saw that there wasn't much difference in the response. But when MDMA was added, um, the uh, people with dissociative subtype did at least as well as the people without it. So I think that's some exciting data not necessarily expected that should be followed up. Um, and in, in looking at, you know, our primary outcome measure was the CAPS-5, but we were also interested in, in what else is going on for people. Um, and so we did some of these um, ex exploratory measures of self-efficacy, like self-compassion scale, alexithymia, scale and uh, inventory of, of self capacities. And we found um, significant improvements in, in all of those. So um, we're actually about to submit a paper with all the details of that that will hopefully be coming up. Um, of course, we had um, side effects. Uh, these are the most common treatment emergent side effects, things like muscle tightness, decreased appetite, nausea, um, et cetera. These tended to be self-limiting and, and not a big problem. We had predictable increases in blood pressure. Uh, and that's, you know, that's part of the reason we do the careful medical screening. We screen out anybody with um, underlying cardiovascular disease because of the uh, blood pressure increases. And there were three um, areas of adverse events of special interest that FDA asked us to look at going into phase three, suicidality, cardiovascular events, and abuse potential. And we didn't see a, a signal on any of those. If anything, they were more common in the placebo group. So the safety uh, was good and the, the, um, obviously the p-value was very good. There were limitations, of course, uh, a few more dropouts in the placebo group, um, some due to COVID, but, um, a few more in any case. Um, we had a problem with racial and ethnic diversity in the first phase three. We've made quite a lot of progress on that in the second phase three that's going on now. Um, and MAPS has made a big effort to recruit uh, a more diverse group of therapists and participants, and we're making headway. Challenge maintaining the blind is a, is a big challenge with this kind of compound, um, of course. And um, our conclusion was the best, and the FDA agreed, the best we could do is do our best with the double blind design for the therapists and the participants, and then have really rigorous blinding for the raters. And there were a few more integrated visits in the, in the placebo, uh, in the MBMA group than the placebo group. We, that, that's the, the status in uh, North America and Israel. These are the sites in, in Europe that are coming along. Uh, some of these sites are already uh, well into phase two and approaching phase three trials in Europe. I'm talking mainly about PTSD today, but I wanted to mention MAPS has sponsored some other uh, trials, one with anxiety associated with life-threatening illness that was promising. Then in the middle here, um, Charlie Grove again with Alicia Danforth at, at Harbor UCLA. 
uh, did a, a study with social anxiety and adults on the autism spectrum and very promising results there. And, and we did a study in Charleston uh, with um, couples in which one person had PTSD and they both received MDMA at the same time in, embedded in a course of cognitive behavioral and joint therapy. So that's going to be pursued further uh, pretty soon too. But um, thinking just one word about uh, the possible, we think that MDMA, if it's approved, is going to have a REMS, a risk evaluation mitigation strategy. And we don't know what that'll be, of course, ahead of time, but we discussed it with FDA and we think some of the features will be, um, it won't be a take-home drug from pharmacies. It'll be administered in only in certified clinics, meaning people who have had proper training and go directly from manufacturer to um, the clinics or the participant. We're not sure how that's gonna work, but it'll, there'll be strict controls on diversion. We're pretty sure. So a little about the therapeutic approach we use. Um, you can read the details in, the, in our manual if you're interested. It's available free of charge on the MAPS website. Uh, and it's really our adaptation of uh, a lot of it's based on what we learned from Stanislav Grof, uh, who was an early LSD researcher, very prominent LSD researcher, uh, who published uh, quite a few papers before that became illegal. Um, and we combine that with what we've learned over the years about treating trauma. So um, this is a picture of our um, research site in Charleston. That's me and my wife quite a few years ago um, and our study coordinator pretending to be a participant. But this shows what the setup is. People usually started out sitting up. They could sit up with pillows and then when they were comfortable, if they wanted to, they could lie down. and um, Often people would spend part of the time with eye shades and headphones listening to music if they were comfortable with that, those were optional. But the way we describe the approach is uh, as a relatively non-directive approach or self-directed, uh, meaning that we're, our intention is to encourage and support whatever um, comes up for that individual without an agenda about what it should be ahead of time. And as I see, there are alternating periods of people spend some of the time focusing inward and then alternate that with periods of talking to the therapist. There's no schedule for that. It varies quite widely, but we think both are important. And I've already mentioned that we think it's the integrate, the preparation and the integration are very important. You know, there's a, a lot of history about the idea of set and setting, the mindset and the and the setting and the support available has a, a major influence on, on the experience with these, I'd say all these types of drugs. And we talk about the inner healing intelligence that, that this is kind of based on. That's something we learned from Stan Groff. It may sound a little unscientific, but I, I think it's mainly that we don't understand it fully. If you think about, you know, I was an ER doctor for 10 years, a long time ago. I didn't know how to heal a wound. I only know how to remove obstacles and, and create favorable conditions for healing. And then, you know, the, the healing process happened, uh, flowed from there and was within the, that individual. Um, it's in a way, it reminds me also of um, immunotherapy for cancer. You know, that's based on stimulating and supporting a person's own innate capacity for healing. Uh, so it's a similar idea. I think that, that that's the way it works in the psyche in many ways too. Uh, and what we notice when we take this approach is even though this, there's a lot about this is much different from most therapy, you know, eight hour sessions, two therapists, MDMA. But one thing we notice is that these elements that are recognized in other approaches to therapy tend to arise spontaneously during the sessions. At, you know, in different ratios and in different orders for each person. But we almost always people end up doing imaginal exposure the way they would in prolonged exposure therapy. But we don't ask them to do that or tell them when to do that. Um, we are open to um, supporting whatever comes and then it, that is bound to come at some time. 
Uh, people will notice cognitive distortions to correct, correct them without our trying to do cognitive behavioral therapy. The transference can be um, even stronger with these types of compounds, and that's an opportunity for working with that in the therapy. Psychodynamic issues are always part of it. You know, people may come in with war trauma, but they're bound to start talking about relationships or uh, childhood, and that can be a really important part of it. Um, we bring attention to the body, uh, so there's overlap with somatic therapies. People often become more aware of the normal multiplicity of, of the psyche, He's talking about being aware of different parts of themselves in a in, you know, non-pathological way. We think that a lot of what happens um, for many people is a powerful uh, corrective attachment experience because MDMA can help increase trust and allow for greater, um, you know, better therapeutic alliance with the therapist. We see people doing kind of Jungian kind of type of active imagination with um, sometimes really beautiful, striking images that come up. And people can have transpersonal or spiritual or mystical experiences. So, you know, we think there's an advantage in being not, not too directive because it allows each person to arrive at whatever combination of these kinds of things uh, is gonna come up for them. It reminds me a little bit of um, this quote I've always liked from Urban Yalom, the therapist must strive to create a new therapy for each patient. And maybe we take it a little further to say, or maybe the therapist must strive to allow and encourage each patient to create a new therapy for themselves. So that's, that's our approach. Always, you know, we're all always very curious about possible mechanisms. So I'm going to talk briefly about that. Um, I'd say the main thing is beware of reductionist thinking. I think this is showing us the breadth and depth of human healing in a way that goes beyond, far beyond what we understand so far. Uh, but there are lots of interesting work going on, different um, theories about it. Uh, it's established that MDMA promotes fear extinction in rodents and now in humans. Uh, Barbara Rothbaum's lab at Emory has done both of those studies now in healthy volunteers. It was also true. Uh, there's work about memory reconsolidation, you know, reconsolidating memory with different associations after it comes up with MDMA. Um, there's a, a, quite a bit of evidence about these types of compounds increasing neuroplasticity. There's a interesting um, rodent study about reopening a social reward learning critical period that normally closes after adolescence. So uh, there are lots of interesting possibilities. Um, and um, here, here's one that's kind of fun. MDMA donated some, I mean, MAPS donated some MDMA to Goldolan in her lab. And she found that octopi who are apparently normally solitary, they spend a all their time in their holes, except during mating season, or when you put MDMA in the water, they also come out and, and hang out with each other. So I'm just gonna mention a couple more lines of research that um, fit well with what we observe clinically. You know, it's known that um, for many people with PTSD, there's decreased activity in prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, even smaller hippocampus, and increased activity in amygdala. Um, so, uh, and that may not be true for complex PTSD, so it's complicated. But it's interesting because we also know that what, among many other things, MDMA increases activity in prefrontal cortex, decreases acti activity in amygdala. So, and this would fit with this idea of the window of tolerance or the optimal arousal zone that others have written about in other kinds of therapy. This is adapted from Pat Ogden's, one of her books. The idea is that if you're hyper aroused, overwhelmed by anxiety, disorganized processing, it's not helpful to revisit trauma. Conversely, if you're hypo aroused, kind of not emotionally numb, as also happens in PTSD often, it, it's, it, you may be able to talk about the trauma, but it's not so helpful. So there's this idea that there's this optimal arousal zone or window of tolerance in between where therapeutic change can happen. It looks like to us that one thing MDMA does is give people 
a few hours in this optimal arousal zone so they can process the trauma effectively in a way they haven't been able to before with all the fear and, or the numbing. That's one area that fits with what we observe. Another area is, is there's a lot of work now with changes in neural networks, especially the default mode network and the way they relate to each other. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, Robin Carr Harris, who's done a lot of this work at Imperial College London and now at UCSF, um, has this theory about relaxed beliefs under psychedelics. This is not an MDMA paper, but it's about 5-HT2A drugs. And I think it fits with MDMA. And his idea is that um, normally we walk around with overweighted prior beliefs from the cortex. And especially if you have PTSD or some other problem that amplifies that, it can be a pathologically overweighted prior beliefs that kind of maintain the, the problem. And Robin's theory is that one thing these drugs do is turn that overweight, turn down the overweighted prior beliefs and allow for more new information from outside of the limbic system to, to come through. So Mendel Kalin, one of the researchers in his lab, uh, the way he described what this means for non-neuroscientists is it's as if you've been sledding down a snowy hill and you, after a while you can't turn out of the track. And this is like new fallen snow, these changes in the networks. And that's really consistent with what we see that suddenly people are, have a possibility of responding differently, taking a, a different route down the mountain, if you will. And I mentioned secure attachment. There's quite a lot of work on this. It has a lot to do with oxytocin, also serotonin, still not completely clear, but I think that's a powerful effect we observe people are able to connect and have a corrective experience. So I'm gonna, before we show a quick video, I'll read a few quotes from participants to give you a little feel for, for it. This is an important one. Several people in the studies said I, things like, I don't know why they call this ecstasy. So this points to the important reality that it's not just that people get blissed out and everything's okay. Processing trauma is challenging with or without MDMA. MDMA just may make it possible, but it's not a cakewalk. And this is part of the reason for uh, the real importance of integration and uh, preparation and integration because people can get destabilized temporarily as they're working through the trauma, just like any deep therapy. This person, when it, maybe one of the things the drug does is let your mind relax and get out of the way because the mind is so protective about the injury. I think that's a beautiful description of, of what many people noticed. Fits with the idea of amygdala being turned down. Many people said things like this, I'll let you read it, um, but it's people said, it changed my relationship time to my emotions once I was able to have a different kind of experience in, in working with them. This is a, a nice one, I'll let you read that. Not skipping the stuff in the attic seems pretty helpful for psychotherapy. And this is another um, important point this veteran said, as interesting as the sessions are, I know from experience now that it's even more interesting what happens after the sessions when you're making connections. So that again points to that it's an unfolding process that gets catalyzed by the MDMA, but then it keeps going along after that. So I'll show you a short video. Um, this is a Marine veteran who's graciously allowed us to allow me to sh share this. Um, he had two tours as a turret gunner in Iraq, a lot of combat trauma. The quote, index trauma was when his Humvee was blown up and his friend died. And he had you know, lots of PTSD symptoms with the baseline caps four, this was of 75, and then it went to 12 at one year. But in the prep sessions, um, he told us what bothered him the most of all the symptoms was this rage that would erupt. And then he yell at his wife and then he feel great remorse. And what he described, he said, the way I experienced this, I have this image uh, 
he told us in the prep sessions, I have this image of a monster erupting from my torso. I'm trying to choke it out. It's stabbing me in the side. And that you'll hear him what happens with that in the his first MDMA session. Are you ready to take your capsule? Sure. <laughs> I just want to tell y'all, I had this like, um, this really intense like feeling come over my body and my heartbeat started beating real fast, but I didn't get, at, at first like I started feeling like a little afraid, but then once I started breathing, I, I mean, I've never felt that before, like I literally felt my heartbeat start to slow down and everything when I started breathing and just relax and like mm -hmm. the sensation, I don't know, it was amazing how not quickly it went away, but just how in control I felt of mm. making it go away. So mm. right. usually I've, I've had those feelings. Mm -hmm. In a way, it kind of felt like when a panic attack kind of comes on, mm -hmm. and my heartbeat started, and I felt my whole body flush and mm -hmm. get really hot. And then mm -hmm. I was just amazed how I was able to not really fight it, but mm -hmm. kind of relax. But yeah. So you nice. may have ways. I don't know, think about it. Now, when I got blown up myself, I, uh, I don't know, I see it completely different now. I, thinking about it, I really, that moment that I got blown up, when it was happening and everything was moving so slow and my mind was just racing at the speed of light. It was, and I can really go back and visualize it. I've never been able to visualize it so hard before. I can mm -hmm. really feel what it was like and there was this I just feel like I should tell y'all something that was just... It's hard to put it in words. Um, that aspect of me that's just really rageful and also besides that image I told y'all about of, you know, the fighting with them, mm -hmm. I had this image of it like in a jail cell, yeah, yeah like mm -hmm. I had that mm -hmm. part of me locked up in jail, mm -hmm. and it's just. And I thought of that, and I felt like so. I felt like I put that person there, and I went to it and just opened the door and like hugged that person, and then the eyes just faded away, and it no longer had kind of an evil look to itself and like we like I visualized both of us just taking apart the jail cell and just you know like really becoming friends and then I visualized I visualized that image I told you about of me like it coming out of my hips and it stabbed me in the side and everything mm -hmm. and I just had a strong visualization of me like reaching up where the knife was on my side and taking it out and like I took my hands off of its neck and didn't choke it anymore and just like really embraced it and like I don't know I feel like I don't know I part of me realized that I think that I was taking that person and 
and keeping them locked up because I was so afraid of them and then that by putting them in that cell and keeping them locked up that I was just making it worse for him mm. and I was mm. it really more beneficial if we kind of work together and mm -hmm. I'd be you know the, I don't know I just like it was really amazing I, <laughs> I never realized how much I I thought I was being the peaceful person but I didn't realize how much I was punishing that 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 aspect of me mm. Mm. I think I was just I think maybe in Iraq I saw what it was capable of and I think I was too afraid to, mm -hmm. you know, and a part of me just feels like so bad that I, I did that to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's me, but I just mm -hmm. describe yeah. it wisely. Why are you? Um, yeah. I don't know, I just got this amazing sense of just, I guess wisdom. I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Sounds a lot like wisdom to me. I know, it, was, it was really feel like so much more at peace with like mm -hmm. everything. Great. Like, even if I try and think about Iraq and everything, like I somehow feel like really peaceful about the fact that that's my journey and that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Part of me think I mean, I mean, I know this is um, part of the, um, you know, part of the drug, but when I try and think, you know, am I going to be able to hold on to this, um, this understanding and this um, somewhat of wisdom, this knowledge that I have now? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, just asking myself that question, I feel like it's so profound that I don't think I could really forget it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about it now, you know, whenever I I blow up on people or blow up on my wife and get all, you know, angry and yelling at her, I feel like it's because I kept that person locked up in mm. course it's going to be hateful and resentful for being locked up and so when it comes to the surface like that it's going to be mean and make people cry mm -hmm. I really feel like mm -hmm. letting it breathe and letting it be is just going to be yeah so much better for me mm -hmm. I think so I mean, I, part of me that's saying like it's all your fault that you created all those those feelings, those the anger and all that other stuff, but then I don't know what part of me is saying that because every time it says that, this, that sage part of me just says it's part of being human, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. I don't know why I couldn't have come up with this on my own, but I'm, I'm glad I, I'm glad I found it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad too. <laughs> to be alive and thankful for the experience.
Okay. Th thank you, Michael. An outstanding presentation of a topic that I think w w we will perceive as being of increasing importance to the work we do. And thank you for your pioneer work in this area. We have a few minutes left and time for a question or two. Fortunately, we have some in questions logged in the Q&A. We'll start with one from Dr. Walter Dunn. Uh, and uh, Dr. Dunn asks, uh, can you comment on the role of the supplementary MDMA dose in the phase three trials? Is the purpose to extend the duration of the medicine sessions or is it to achieve a greater peak MDMA effect that is difficult to obtain with a single dose? Has MAPS compared the efficacy of a single versus two dose medicine session? And uh, much of the discussion about real world implementation challenge, challenges center around the length of the medicine sessions. With a single MDMA dose, I'm assuming sessions could be four to six hours compared to six to eight hours with the dual dosing model, making single dose sessions easier for implementation. So se several questions wrapped up in one and uh, uh, maybe you can take a crack, crack at those. Yeah, well, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, the intention was really to uh, extend the session a bit with the supplemental dose. We started out without the supplemental dose in the first half of the first trial, and then we added it um, with that intention. I think my impression, and we do have some data with and without the supplemental dose because it was optional. I don't think we have enough data to definitively answer that yet, but our impression is that supplemental dose really isn't necessary in most cases. It doesn't add all that much. So I think, as Dr. Dunn points out, um, there's going to be challenges. If this is approved, there are going to be challenges to implement it. So we're, we need to look more at those kinds of things. But I think it'll come down to one dose being adequate. We're also looking at two versus three sessions. Rachel E. Hood at Bronx VA uh, right now is, is doing a study to compare two sessions versus three sessions using the same method. So a lot more to be learned about how we can um, you know, make it as cost effective as possible if it is approved. Great. Thank, thank you. Um, let's see, another question from Michael Agress. How would MDMA compare with ketamine-assisted psychotherapy? Well, we don't know the answer to that yet either. Ketamine effects are shorter uh, and they vary a lot with the dose. So um, I think MDMA is quite different from high dose ketamine, uh, which is more of a uh, transpersonal or dissociative experience, which can be very powerful for people. Lower dose of the ketamine from what I understand from the people using ketamine with therapy can be more like MDMA sessions in some way. So I think um, there's quite a bit of overlap as well as um, some important differences that, uh, again, I think it, once, if these drugs are all, more of these drugs are in use, we'll be able to start to answer those kinds of questions better. Right, thank you. And a question from um, Elizabeth Terry. Given the tactile nature of many's, many experiences with MDMA, do clients ask for physical contact with the therapist? If so, how do the therapist handle clients' requests for contacts? Seems like this could be really tricky. It is tricky, and it's a very important question that we spend a lot of time on because obviously good boundaries and ethics are key to, to doing this uh, well and ethically. Um, we, we spend a lot of time in the preparation sessions discussing touch and how they feel about that, making emphasizing that the option to not be touched at all is perfectly fine and it's completely up to them. But it is true that some people really feel that some touch would be helpful to them if they're revisiting a time when they needed that. So it's what we offer is if people agree to it, and again, we're very careful about agreements, if that's what they want, we could offer holding their hand, putting a hand on their shoulder. You saw us with our arm around neck in that session. So uh, a hug to a certain extent can be something we're okay with if that's what they want. We do not do any kind of 
you know, bare skin contact on the torso. We don't do any kind of full body contact. We don't work in the, um, you know, on the torso without a pillow there. So we're, it's important to be very careful about it. But in a way, it would be simpler just to say no touch to make sure there's no confusion. But we think that would be problematic too, because some people um, really feel that if you could hold their hand or even put your hand or over their shoulder, it's very, very uh, comforting and, and a corrective experience for them. So really important to be very, very careful with those agreements and the boundaries. Great. And I think we have time for maybe one final question from Diana Luxenberg. What, was having a religious background important for MDMA to work better? Any correlation there? Uh, we're not aware of any correlation. Um, the only information kind of related to that is um, that in, the, in our studies in phase two, at least, we look at the uh, mystical experiences uh, questionnaire. The, the, the scale um, that was developed at Johns Hopkins for uh, largely for work with psilocybin. And what they found in a lot of the studies at Hopkins was that if people had a full-blown mystical experience, that correlated strongly with their the benefit. What we saw with MDMA, that was with psilocybin. What we saw with MDMA was uh, about a third of the people reached that threshold on the scale for a full-blown mystical experience, but it didn't correlate with their outcome on the caps. Um, people that had a different kind of experience did just as well with their PTSD symptoms. Having said that, for the people, our impression was for the people that had those experiences, it was very important to their healing process. And we noticed that some people who had a religious background had mystical experiences kind of that were consistent with their, their religious background. So um, that's, that's what we know about that at this point. Well, I, we've reached the end of our time, Michael. I really want to thank you again for um, for giving this uh, tr truly uh, you know, extraordinary talk on a fascinating topic that we're bound to hear much more about. So thank you again. I hope the next time you'll be able to come out in person. I hope so, Charlie. That would be fun. Thanks very much. I really appreciate this opportunity, and I appreciate your being here to introduce me because, as I said, you, you started down this road before we did even. Great. Well, great, great seeing you again, Michael. And we'll, um, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll uh, do this again, one, one form or another. I hope so. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Bye.